Hello everyone. So just like every one of our streams in the last week, we were all vibing backstage to that animation and that fun music. And I know I keep saying it, but it's just super fun to see something visual like that. It's good. And so um, this is our final event for our High Graph Studio beta launch um, series of events. And we left the nerdiest one for last. So today we are going to be talking um, with all, our, well, with a whole bunch of our engineers, right? And so any questions you might have on, hey, what is that performance thing that you did? Or how deep did you go into certain specific features of a framework? And then you felt like you hit a wall. What did you do to fix it? Like all that, we'll discuss it today. Before we dive in, though, um, as I ask every time, put in the chat where you're from and what the weather is. And maybe also like Low asked on, I think this third stream we had, what are you drinking? I'm just refilling my bottle here. Maybe other folks are already having a beer. Maybe not, up to you, let me know. And so um, one last thing that I actually wanted to mention that I'm actually quite proud of. We also released on Product Hunt with, the light, with our studio beta. And we went to number six for the day. And you think, ah, number six, you know what? That's incredible. There's like a thousand new releases a day 
on Product Hunt. So I'm super proud. Anyways, without further ado, let's get all these folks on the screen. I'm just going to be clicking on pictures here and all of them are going to show up. And we have everybody here. And so we have such a... Um, awesome panel with so many people um, going around and introducing everyone is going to be like, okay, let's wait for the next. It's a little boring. So guys, when I ask you the first question, you can introduce yourself, say what you want and all that. And if you have any questions in the audience, feel free to ask them. Today is the day to ask any technical question you have. We will answer it. And if we cannot, we have Alexi here, who's from the product team, who will put some guardrails on what we can say or not if that's necessary, but assume we're going to go down into it. And so let's kick this off with Resap, um, because you worked a lot on like our remix implementation, right? And so can you first of all talk about why did we choose remix as a meta framework to actually build this application? Because it sounds like this is a sing is an ideal candidate for a single page app with React, for example. And when you um, explain it, what is a meta framework? All those things. But before you go, say your name correctly, who you are, and what you do, and then dive in. Because yeah, I thanks, Jim. It correctly. Sorry, go on. Thanks, Jim. Yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm I'm Rishabh. Um, it's pronounced pronounced Rishabh. So yeah. There you go. I, I think did that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been working at Tigra for around one year now, and I've been involved in the studio web app rewrite uh, from the beginning. So I guess I'm probably one of the right persons to talk about it. Um, yes, why remix? Definitely, like that's uh, that's a question that we should ask. Uh, so we wanted to design a clean architecture, I think, based on our learnings from the old web app, and we explored remix, and it seemed to provide all the right primitives for us uh, upon which we could build upon. Um, Remix helped us uh, has helped us significantly cut down complexity uh, from the front end and like distribute it uh, in different parts. Um, let's there are a couple of things that we can talk about. It first thing is like bundle size with an SPA. Like your bundle size increases with the amount of features that you want to build. That's that's one of the problems with SPAs. Remix helped us significantly uh, cut down our bundle size because we moved a lot of our data fetching and transformations to the Remix backend, so it's not included in the bundle size. That's one of the things. I think Remix can do everything that an SPA can, can do, but uh, Remix can also do things that an SPA can't do. So for example, like you're on a content table and you want to render some huge markdown file, right? Uh, in an SPA, you would also you would import a whole of the Markdown library on the browser. So the whole JavaScript bundles for the Markdown library will be on your browser. With Remix, you don't need that. Like your, your Markdown can be pre-rendered on the server. Uh, you don't need to send the Markdown library to your uh, browser. So it's, it's significantly faster. Um, second thing, Remix helped us uh, drastically reduce the amount of complexity uh, and like uh, simplify the code base. One, one prime example of uh, that I can give is we are not using any kind of state management solution. Uh, and for such a complex web app as ours, that's staggering. I mean, I have not seen any such complex app which is not using any kind of state management. So yes, that is, I think, the power of Remix. And I think uh, we invested in Remix because we see, we see some potential. There are some up really good upcoming features, like Remix is going to support these React server components. So oh, yeah. with these things, yeah, it's going to be, I think we just, uh, we it's a new architecture designed from ground up with extensibility and scale in mind. Uh, and we are going to benefit from the Remix and the React ecosystem in general. I, I hope I was able to do justice to the question. <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Like, it's really fun to me to see that we went, there's all these different things where at first, first all backend, all SSR, then we went single page app, then we went hybrid. And now we're in a different form of hybrid where you can get to control. Like it's like we've had these hybrid versions um, where you had bundles for backend and front end and then or like client and server. And then sometimes the server bundle will also be in the client and you didn't know when and all that stuff. And so with that in mind, things are less complex now. And so 
Mirko, I know you've worked on all of that, like working on that complexity, um, state management, things like that. So first, say who you are and what you do, and then can you talk a little bit about that reducing complexity and where we won a lot of you know battles, let's yeah. say. For sure. Thanks, Tim. So I'm Mirko. I joined Highgraph uh, a little more than six months ago, um, right before the we started the work uh, working on the Highgraph Studio and working as a full stack software developer on development experience team. Um, so yes, um, like server side rendering, um, especially um, eliminating the state management in the client. Um, really helped us reduce the complexity because, as 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 we know that when you have some uh, you know client side front end code that needs to load the data and then store it, sometimes that data can become stale, and then you start fighting sure. and worrying about like cache uh, revalidation issues, which are always hard to debug. So um, Remix completely removes that complexity. So. Um, when anytime you let's save something, you have a form. Uh, Remix uh, does that data revalidation for you. So, um, but with this hybrid approach where you have data on the server and then the new data is just rehydrated, you don't have that full page refresh that we had in the single um, not the single page, but the, the old server side apps where you you know submit a form and then everything reloads, uh, which means that uh, Remix makes it super fast to just uh, you know send the payload and then it just do does its magic. It um, it it refreshes the parts of UI that has to be uh, refreshed. And as a developer, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, even some things like uh, canceling requests that are already in progress, Remix does that for you. So. That means less code on the front end and less potential for for uh, bugs to happen in a code. So that, that's one of the things that we really liked about, about this uh, new approach. Um, also, this concept of nested routes in Remix, uh, which I wouldn't try to explain right now, but- uh, That was my next question. <laughs> oh yeah, that, that's super exciting thing because- uh, Maybe you can give a quick overview of what a nested route actually means, and then we don't have to go too deep. We can, we can go to other places. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, if you have like a complex page and um, you you access it with URL, um, that page would be broken down by Remix into multiple components or routes. And when you hit that URL, all these routes start loading in parallel. So let's say you have a main page and then you have sidebar and then you have main content area and then have right sidebar. Those are completely different uh, routes or pages. So Remix would load them in this installation, and then you will get the whole HTML as, as a result, um, which means as a developer, you can focus on one area and don't worry that much on other areas as you are working on them, um, which turned out to be great because like right now we have at Highgraph uh, more than 10 developers working at the same time on one code base. And we've yeah. done that in studio for the past six months. And we don't have that much code hotspots where we have all, you know, you know what I mean? So that that really, um, I think it's a good benefit of this kind of uh, architecture with nested routes. Cool. Um, I do have one sub question because in your title, it says full stack engineer, right? So we're going to have to do this. So as oh, a full stack dev, oh. <laughs> you centered. I, I saw every time I see a full stack dev, I'm gonna have to ask it. Of course, it makes zero yeah. sense to ask this, but just for fun, entertain me. I yeah, I often <laughs> find myself uh, you know asking myself the same question, like how do I do that? And in the end of the day, I just ask some front end engineer to help me because I forget it as soon as I center it every time I need to. And it's a, just a joke. No, um, it's but, the perfect answer to this question because we cannot all know everything. And if you have to touch both ends, you can definitely not know. So let's yeah. normalize that we just ask our colleagues and find things on, you know, ask ChatGPT maybe, you know? <laughs> because anyways, this was just a sub, like for my personal enjoyment. So of course we built the, the studio, right? But there's also other bits 
that are involved there that helped us a lot with performance. And for that, I want to talk to Jonas um, about our regional management server. And so in the last few days where we did all these live streams, we talked quite a bit about this regional management server. But Jonas, of course, say your name, what you do and all that. And then for the question is, what does it do for users? Why do people have to care when we say something like regional management server? It kind of sounds like part of high graph. And so just you know, delve in a little bit what it actually is, what we change there, and how end users can actually benefit from it. Yeah, thanks, Tim. So I'm Jonas. I'm actually a day one high graph slash actually I still remember the old name, graph CMS nice. employee. Maybe you have some old uh, GraphCMS users in the chat. Please let us know if you if you have been following us this long. Um, so I've been with uh, HiGraph almost seven years now, and I've seen a lot of things. I started in the front end and went to the back end and also went back to the front end for some of the studio initial uh, prototyping. So um, the management server is really a crucial piece of the whole uh, HiGraph architecture. We, we have the studio, which is like the, the thing you interact with. We have the content API, which you are kind of talking to and actually getting your data from when you're an engineer working uh, with high graph content. And then you also have the management API, which is the thing you sometimes see, sometimes you don't see, but you uh, are using it every day as a mm. developer. So it, let's say you are adding a new model. Uh, this will go to the management API and the management API is kind of responsible for shaping your project and creating this actual model. And then it's also talking back to the content kind of side of things and telling the content side of things, hey, we may need to actually uh, put some new place where we can store the, the, this content in that you are now wanting to manage. And um, yeah, it's it's really a crucial, a crucial piece um, to the whole architecture. and. Some months ago, we basically phased out the old global management server and switched to a regional approach, which was a gigantic project. And we have many people um, that were involved. I'm not the only ones, uh, so really don't want to forget that. But the management server really is important when interacting with, with the app, right? It's, it's doing the modifications that I talked about, but also every page you visit, we need to know the structure of the project to kind of display it. And that's something that the studio folks uh, needed to do a lot, right? They they want to display your content page. They need to know what fields and, and, and how is the shape of your project. So every time we wanted to display that information in the past, we would need to go to a central server that's just uh, running in Frankfurt. And that, of course, was super bad for performance in other regions, right? And we now change to a model where each region that you can select when you create your project has its own management servers. And that helps a ton for performance because we now don't need to talk like across the globe, um, but we can stay within the region. So your content and your management data and also the running services are all co-located together in one region. Cool. So I know part of this thing was written in Golang. And I want to know why, how, what was that decision? Is it just pure like, oh, crap, it has to be extra fast. We're going to go Golang. Or is there a champion in the company that says, look at this, let's do it. So can you elaborate a little bit? Yeah. So we we have been like quite polyglot, as we like to call it, uh, in the development world for, for quite a while. So we've been mm -hmm. using the kind of languages that fit best for the job. That's but awesome. We also learned that, like for many of the services we started to create in Go, they are pretty like flawless. We don't have this like going back and thinking like, oh, maybe we wanted to write it in a different language instead, and it would be nicer if we now switch to this in this language. For the Go services, we really um, like the way we can work with them, right? So the kind of developer experience, but also the mm -hmm. performance, of course. Um, so it's like a combination and. When it was time to build a new service, some now we kind of tend to just default to Go. If there's not a specific no. reason why you want to have it in something else, we build it in Go because we all kind of like it and we like how mm. 
easiest to, to work with it. And it doesn't have some of the issues that um, we maybe don't like about the TypeScript uh, ecosystem. But yeah. of course, there are reasons to use it. And that's why, for example, for the, for the uh, studio front end, right, we still choose TypeScript and we play the benefits of Remix. But then for some backend services, we play the benefits of Go and we, mm -hmm. we use it for that. So the piece that you were talking about is we still needed some global service, right? Because you have the page you land on when you open up the app and we wanted to show all your projects basically across regions, right? So um, we didn't want you to kind of hunt around different regional API, uh, like front ends to find your app. So we still wanted something that replaces everything, right? Yeah. And that is the, the, the new service that we introduced. We call it the directory service. It's basically mm -hmm. an overview of all your projects. And we uh, have written the backend in Go. It's a GraphQL API, as you may expect from like us. We we like GraphQL still very much, and we yeah we use the Go GraphQL gen to kind of whip up the oh, the really? GraphQL server fairly yeah. fast, and um, it 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 works awesome. And after you then click into your project, you basically don't interact with that service anymore at all. You start to interact with more world that is actually pretty similar to how it worked before, only that instead of now deploying this, the management server in one region, we, we have one dedicated for that specific region that your project that you navigated to is deployed in. And that makes a whole bunch of interactions much faster. It also makes a whole bunch of problems that could arise in the past no longer really possible. One thing that we had in the past is that regions couldn't really communicate anymore. So both regions are alive, right? Frankfurt is alive and maybe your project lives in Asia and it's alive, but the internet link between the two clusters is not perfect. So we now have problems, even though you may be in Asia and the Asia region is totally fine, right? So now we reduce these risks by a bunch by moving the management server into the Asia region, and then you can use it. And I'm using Asia as an example because it's simple to think uh, about yeah. me, and it's like the, the, the furthest away uh, for, for, for my Frankfurt yeah. brain. Um, but it, it's, it's something that you can apply to anything. Like our US customers benefit hugely, so they don't need to go across the pond for every single like render uh, now for rendering their, their page, but also for modifying and updating the schema. So that is a, a gigantic benefit for performance. And it also helps us to kind of isolate customers more. So in the past, we had one gigantic um, region in Frankfurt that was basically responsible for all management tasks for all projects. And now if you have like your own dedicated world um, as an enterprise customer, you also get your own dedicated management server, which is your own. So we can set certain special settings for it. We can be sure that no other customer can interact with the data. So it's really a big uh, step in, in the direction of uh, tenant isolation. Oh, that's awesome. I'll go back to that later because I will have some questions about what a noisy neighbor means and things like that. But first, I'm actually super excited by the fact that sometimes for some services we choose, okay, here we use Golang, here we use something else. That means we are super composable. We're working in the world of composable architectures and iGraph itself as well which means the management server is something that's so just, it sits there and you can use HiGraph without the studio if you wanted to, if you use all these other services. And I, we're one of the few CMSs that actually do that. So now my marketing is out of the way. And um, it's a nice bridge because actually it being so composable also means that we can have the studio next to the classic and it just works. Asset management can be there, separated. And so I want to now go to Luca because he's been working on caching strategies, all about how to make all these services faster. And so, Luca, can you maybe um, dive in a little bit to explain maybe the differences of what you've done on the caching side of things or maybe tell us about what are the different ways of caching because caching is probably the hardest thing in software development. So. Um, good luck trying to explain. Thank you, Tim. So yeah, hello, I'm Luca. I'm senior engineer. Um, I've been full stack, although at iGraph since I joined, so one year ago. I've been mainly dealing with backend stuff, and mm -hmm. uh, as Tim was uh, talking about, especially cache. Um, so 
why are we interested in cash and why you are interested in cash um, is for two reasons. First, computing a response can be expensive and take time, just CPU time to, to have your results. And uh, also the, um, the place where this response is at the beginning might be far away from you. Uh, so we use CDNs and if you heard about CDNs, you might have heard that you have point of presence. So these nodes that are close to you and normally you receive, if uh, in case of a cache hit, you receive the response from those nodes once it's computed. So this is the goal of a cache and what changes uh, from the previous model and what we have been working on in the recent months uh, is in principle is all about granularity. So when working with caches is very important. I just that... took the liberty to put your screen on, sorry to interrupt. So if you wanted to, to show some stuff, you could. Yeah, I will get to it in a second. Okay, sure. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll put it on in a sec. Yeah, thank you. Um, My bad. No worries, it, it was fine. Um, so what I was saying that it is very important that you can be as much as specific when you invalidate things in order to evict as, as a smaller portion of um, your cache as possible. Um, so it's a very fine balance that you need to find because if you push too much, then your cache hit ratio goes down and also you increase the load on your systems and maybe the database fires up. And if you push too low, then you have the biggest problem probably of stale content that may stay there forever. So finding what to push and where to push is very important. And if we can do this um, with, um, in an accurate way, but staying specific, that's super good. So. What changed is that before, uh, also now, because this feature is about to be released, um, before we were caching um, at model level. What it means is that we could only know uh, that a response was about some of your models. With the new, the new caching strategy, we will know, we will try to know what uh, documents are in your response. Um, because it's very important to to detect what a response depends on. And before, the dependency sources were just models. Now we can have also more, uh, documents. So when you update a document, now the goal is to only uh, invalidate the part of the cache that depends on that specific document and not all the, the responses that have that model, uh, the, the model of that uh, document. So if you can turn my screen on, I can yes, I can demonstrate what it is about. Um, so in this space, I have um, I'm Italian, so I decided to go for a recipe alike. It's um, dinner time around here, my friend. I'm so hungry. <laughs> project, but yeah, I didn't uh, um, produce the content of this myself. It was just GPT, so don't bother me if the recipes are wrong. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just to demonstrate the, the principle. So here I have two queries that both refer to the same model, which is a recipe. Uh, so if I query Alfredo Pasta, I get the content of the recipe. If I query um, Spaghetti Camarara, I get the content of the Spaghetti Camarara recipe. Pretty cool, the reasonable. Uh, if I do the same um, requests again, uh, what happens? If you look at the dev tools here, uh, you can see there's a second request for each recipe was a hit. What it means is that the first request got to our system, to our system, and it was produced, and then it was saved in the closest CDN node to me. Uh, and the second request uh, didn't arrive to our system, but it was replied directly from that node. And as you see, it's faster. If this was as Jonas' case uh, in Asia, uh, I will receive it. Uh, I will see even a higher difference. So in the current model, so the user one, uh, if I do an update, like I want to update the Fredo Pasta here to have a different title, uh, we run this mutation. And what we will see is that if I now query either of those two queries, uh, I will see a miss. Although I only updated the Alfredo Pasta document. So let's try that. If I query Spaghetti Carbonara, 
that's back to a miss and of course a fatal pasta because it was the uh, directly affected document um now again if i go and so i mess it up but uh, the second the second time i request again it's back to a hit yeah with you did a new twice but that's fine yeah with a new model um that i uh, enabled in a second uh should be enabled uh, i'm going to live territory uh, territory yeah, now. we're living on the edge here yes that's what we like uh, let me do a quick round of update so nothing should happen i will do the same stuff and um get to the point where I cached the Alfredo pasta um, recipe and I cache also the spaghetti carbonara recipe. So back to the time where we do a mutation. If I update the Alfredo pasta now and um, I try to query the spaghetti carbonara, what we should see is that it's now a hit because we didn't modify this recipe. We only invalidated the query that was directly affected Better to say, more specifically, affected by the by the mutation. So if I query, the um, Alfredo pasta is correctly a miss, and that should be the case. So we are essentially much more granular. That's where we're getting to, right, with this stuff. Yes. Indeed. So David does have a question, and I think you just answered it. But let's say, so I guess then you are caching only the parts that are mutated. See, I changed first name, but then query it last name on the entity ID. That would be a cache burst or not. No, that's uh, even more uh, granular. So that would be field level granular. Um, but that's um, not the level we reached already. Not now yet. OK. Yeah. And can I say not yet, or is that just not super feasible to do? It's uh, very difficult. Yeah the the more you go deeper in level the more difficult it becomes to correctly identify what um a response depends on because it's yeah. not only the data that you see here but a response can be affected by external documents it could be affected by um, user settings could be affected by the roles and the permission that they have so if you can or not say see some content um and also subscriptions uh, and payments can affect the what content you can see um and identify effect uh, correctly what is in a response what is affecting a response and when we push when we evict the cache identify what is the blast ratio radius of a mutation it's very difficult and the more granular you, you get the more Crazy things can happen. The more things yeah. need to have in mind. Exactly. So I guess that's why we say that caching and naming are the hardest things. So congrats, you got it this far. Like even the miss is relatively fast looking at this. So that makes me happy as a developer. Yes. I, it, this um, request that I made are also pretty simple to compute. They don't sure. um, okay. fetch a lot of data and they don't need to be. Um, joining a lot of tables in the DB, so they are fast yeah. to execute. Um, of course, the more complex your query becomes, the more time it takes. And so the more you see the benefit of cache. Sure. So um, I want to actually go to Alexei, who has been um, quietly sitting here listening in as the product manager. So I wanted to give you a slightly more high level question of um, why? did we do this whole rebuild? Because we did discuss it a little bit earlier before, right? And so do you have any, on the product side of things, uh, a, a few insights of why now? Why were, why were these changes important? Yeah. I mean, it, it, it uh, yeah, first of all, yeah. Hi, I'm Alexi. Oh, sorry, I'm Alexi, say who you are. My bad. Yeah, I am Alexi. I'm product <laughs> manager of developer experience here at Highgraph. Uh, so yeah, happy to be here. Uh, so it does kind of date back to our rename because the rename from Graph CMS to High Graph didn't happen randomly, right? We had a vision for future of content for content federation platform, and uh, we did rename to support and reinforce that vision. And this 
this trend continues here because we knew we need to deliver even better performance because of our uh, strive to be the real content federation platform we knew we need to deliver more features we need to we need to deliver better performance and to achieve this to take this next next step we needed to kind of step back first and update our foundation invest into our foundation to then do those two steps forward so we sometimes when you when you're working on a system for a long time and then you kind of change the paradigm you need to also look at all the past decisions and see which ones do support this new paradigm and which don't do it anymore and uh, decide like, what do you do and do you invest or do you do you still try to make it work even though your direction is changed or do you invest into making the tools proper tools for yeah. your journey so that is what we did exactly and so um talking about like some of the new paradigms i want to go back to Richard because um you did a lot of work inside the remix side of things and so I've been hearing some super excited developers talk about the fact that we have lots of lazy loading now. Um, we're doing data streaming related things. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on what those two things are anyways, and then also how we use them and why we needed that stuff? Yes, um, thanks, Tim, for the question. Uh, I'll elaborate on lazy loading part first, where like in, in the classic web, what we do is like, we fetch, we fetch all the content uh, of all the fields of all the labels, like because you can have nested components inside the inside the uh, entry. So we just fetch everything upfront, which becomes a huge query and takes a lot of time. And uh, in case of huge entries with a lot of content and a lot of nested content, it can the loading time can go up to like ten seconds um, sometimes. So oh. with lazy loading, what we are aiming is we don't fetch all data upfront. Uh, we just kind of fetch top level fields plus some bit of nested components data. Uh, and even in that case, so now the streaming part will come. Uh, this is where the remix also help, uh, helps us that we just fetch top level fields and we render the page. We don't wait for the components data to be available in order to render the page. So, and uh, so essentially what we do is that we trigger the data loading for components in on the remix backend. Uh, and then we just leave it there. We just render the page. And as the Remix uh, uh, sends us the components data, we just render it. Uh, so it doesn't block the page. Technically, we render the content form as soon as your top level fields are available. And that's super fast. Like I have seen uh, that for content entries, for huge content entries, which takes around uh, six to seven seconds to load in the classic web app, uh, in Studio, it's like, Probably two hundred milliseconds. So that's that's uh, all magnitude. <laughs> so yes, that, that's that's so, what we're putting this. This sounds so magical, and it's just it's this DX coming out of Remix essentially because you say we lazy load it on the server. When I hear these words, I, that doesn't compute. How does that work? What do they do? Do they have separate processes or parallel connections per component? Like how does that work? Yes. So uh, I think one of the powerful features of Remix is it can transport. Uh, I'm gonna be a bit technical here, so sorry. But no, uh, Remix, we want to go. Yeah, Remix <laughs> can serialize uh, uh, JavaScript promises, and it can actually transport that promises promise over the network to the browser. So what, what we do is we just okay. fetch, we just trigger a fetch request on the Remix backend, and then mm -hmm. transport that live promise to the browser. So we are listening to a promise. Uh, uh, through the wire, and that is where the power is because uh, we, we we don't have to we don't have to like uh, wait for everything to become available. We can just uh, push a React suspense boundary, and that's when that suspense boundary resolves when the promise resolves. So all your content is visible, and the content that is kind of streaming through the back backend, and that is really the powerful part that Remix enables. That's incredible. And so suspense, that is a browser. Um, API, right? Because I know we have suspense in Fugees that what I use a lot, but it's also it's in React. It's a React API actually, but suspense as a concept is is probably universal. So yeah, you kind of expect the rendering of a subtree uh, when it's kind of doing some expensive work and only render it when the work is done. So the fact that you can create a promise in Node in the backend and then somehow send it to the front end 
blows my mind a little bit i need to start like looking at this because that's something special and where did this come from is this something that more frameworks nowadays do or did the the people at remix come up with this no i think i think it is not just remix people have been doing this um, especially nextjs uh, they are doing the same thing with okay. their self corrections and stuff so it's it's kind of uh, uh, this this concept is like spreading to all the frameworks now but it's it's not sure. new yeah. okay remix so, makes it super super yes. simple though to kind of use this is mm. one of the big reasons why we chose remix in the first place as like the first one to try and we were really happy with trying, so we didn't really explore too many other options. Um, if it works, it works, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the 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 thing with this promise really is like super magical because the API to kind of teleport that promise over actually is the same API that you use to send normal synchronous data. So oh, you really? only by putting the await in there or not basically decides if you want to wait for the data and send it like synchronously and actually block mm -hmm. the render or you just send the unawaited data which is the promise right and you teleport the promise over and then await on the client side and then you can like show the spinner and that really empowers the developers to kind of say okay we will render some fields and then it's, it's some metric you kind of say okay we stop synchronously waiting for data and we actually like send the remaining data over via promises and that is really the power that, it, that that makes this possible it's not that we couldn't have done it on an spa right you can always course, like yeah. stop loading and big queries and do it simple but uh, uh, and, and and do a complicated thing to fetch many different things and do lazy mm -hmm. loading and and so on it's all possible but it really the difference is that how kind of embraced we are as developers to actually do it because most of the time you have so many other things to worry about that you will not get to actually doing it and that's what you saw on the old app is that we started to fetch too many things at the same time mm -hmm. and it then slows down the system right and this is as like the company has grown and the use cases of people have grown in high graph the uh, the, the system kind of didn't fit perfectly um any more these use cases and now with remix it allows us to kind of adjust this on the fly and maybe even adjust to different size projects right uh, we currently yeah. are not doing this but it it enables us to do things like that right it's crazy just put the await keyword or not i always feel a little bit iffy if i don't put an await keyword because then where does my promise go and suddenly it just works anyways that's awesome it's crazy even yeah i need I to start I'm looking in remix soon like i need to figure out how this works um, so one thing I can add to that, sorry, sorry, go on, uh, Rishab, go on. Yeah, sorry, Tim. Uh, sorry. One thing I can I, I can add to that is that these these things these are just the starting. So remix in the upcoming versions of remix, you could be, you would be able to do a lot of things with these promises. You could return React elements uh, from your loader like as promises. So you actually on, also don't have to do any rendering work on browser. You just send pre-rendered streamed uh, React component to the browser, and they just Without any That's it starts to become we're streaming HTML over the wire now again. Yes. Maybe it will be HTMX soon, but maybe yeah. we shouldn't <laughs> go in that direction now. <laughs> that sounds a little crazy. Um, so um, I want to go quickly back to Mirko because I know you have your screen shared where you wanted to maybe show um, the work that you guys did to make everything less complex. All the stuff we just talked about how that actually ends up for the end user in terms of performance. So um, shall I share your screen so you can like sure, talk sure. about I mean, it? I can just show some of the um, interesting things that we observed after the uh, we launched Studio. So speaking of uh, rendering content sooner. So this is the, um, mm. the HiGraph Classic. Oh, uh, this is the Classic app, okay, sure. Yeah, single page app, uh, eight megabytes. In size, that's not spectacular. Most of the modern single page apps can have even more than that. That's uh, but insane, that's, by the way. Yeah, that's I mean, so the, much. just the bloat of the uh, JavaScript. And by the way, this is only JavaScript. It's not CSS on anything. But oh yeah, you just uh, but just to just consider ten years ago, if we would load nine point nine megabytes of JavaScript to a browser, it would just choke on its memory. Yeah, yeah, and um. 
like um, it, it can take a while and uh, you just have to download all of that and then wait yeah. for browser to parse it and execute it. And only then it starts loading the data. And in um, like mm -hmm. in this Hygraph Studio now, uh, because um, we have server side rendering, the, the bundler can decide or can be more specific of what JavaScript you need for that page. It doesn't have to send every, everything. So it just sends like a fraction of that. It's 1.5 megabytes, which is around 80% of a performance uh, improvement. Um, and not to mention that this is only JavaScript that you need for interaction, but the data mm -hmm. has already started loading in the backend. And then um, the framework itself for the Remix server will send back the, the HTML content. So you would see the user would see the um, page rendered sooner, um, which is uh, like a, a cool concept that we confirmed in the in the high graph studio so previously the single page app performance first contentful paint 1.6 seconds uh, then the largest contentful paint 5.5 seconds uh, nothing uh, unusual for the single page app but then uh, with uh, with this server side rendering first contentful paint is only 0 0.5 seconds um which yeah it's just a combination of server-side rendering, then loading the data in parallel in loaders. So if we have multiple um, you know, pieces of your information that we need to fetch and assemble, we can load it in parallel. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, the content is sent to, to the client to, to render, and then it's hydrated. So it becomes interactive. So user can actually see the content before it, it becomes interactive, but it's seamless for the user. They don't see that, you know, um, content jump or anything so it's it's really yeah, exactly so quick follow-up on this because what you've seen like i don't know personally remix that well but when you look at other traditional frameworks that would do an ssr rendering on the page and then hydrate the javascript on top right what they tend to do the more you render an ssr the more state needs to be rendered into the html so then the javascript can attach to that but sometimes the HTML gets huge and that even then would make it slow to hydrate again. So did we have any of those problems or is Remix like super optimized with this? Um, yeah, well, I don't think we saw such, uh, such problems yet mm. um, because it really um, like from developer experience um, standpoint, it, it just works. Um, I don't know why. It just works. I want to hear these yeah. things. That's cool. Yeah, like uh, I never uh, had an issue where I had to uh, figure out what's happening in the framework. <laughs> well, that's actually pretty cool because certain frameworks, so I'm just looking at my notes here, um, have a little bit more, we will give you some black magic and the developer experience becomes so incredible. You never have to think, but if there's a bug, you have to dive in and you will not find it. And then there's other ones where it's basically like if you look at Next.js and React, it's so open that you could do anything. It's just JavaScript. But then the DX, like now, it's slowly less good. And of course, yeah, I know. Wait. <laughs> uh, we're not going to go here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so do you feel like Remix found like a nice balance there? Is it like not too much black magic, but just enough so it feels smooth? Yeah, it does feel smooth for sure. One thing that we notice though, like uh, sometimes in the end-to-end -end tests, like that we use Playwright to write tests. Oh, cool. Yeah. The, 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 the like computer is so fast to click on the fields mm -hmm. that it does it before the form hydrates. So now the new thing is when you write end-to-end -end tests for these new kind of frameworks, you need to worry about hydration. So you don't... Yeah, exactly. It's not that you only need to wait for DOM to load, but then you also need to wait for your form to become uh, interactive. Yeah. Um, so one thing that I noticed, observed, don't know, don't, I'm not really sure if that's a remix thing or not, but um, what, what they do is that uh, the form uh, is disabled uh, before it's uh, hydrated, so you can rely on that. But then if you have some that's special cool. logic, some hook, then you, you, you have to worry about it when you're, uh, when you're writing tests. 
I imagine the, um, the famous on document ready that we used in jQuery is coming back for those kind of tests. Um, yeah. My friend Debbie works at um, uh, the test suite there that Microsoft built. So she's going to be super happy when I can show her all the stuff we're doing. That's fun to see. Um, so I want to actually go back to um, Luca quickly because I know you had on your screen, Luca, you had this um, explanation of different types of cache. And so um, I would love for you to go into that a little bit to kind of just show everyone um, what it takes because there's lots of challenges there, right? Yes. So I can I just I'll put you on the screen. Yeah, yeah, this one. Exactly. This is like, let's go to university and then Luca will explain to us how this all works. No, hopefully it's going to be fast. Um, but this is a visualization of what I uh, was talking about before. This is the yeah. previous model. You can think about this index like an index of what is inside a response. It's better if I do this first. So here we have a response of that uh, recipe project where we have fields and we have nested references for, to another model. Uh, we have also multi um, multiple reference nested here with the recipe steps. Um, what we can consider overall um, is here on the right. It's like an index of what the content of the response is. Um, but with model level, which is the current and what we try to move from, with model level caching, we were only considering this part. Of course, this tree could also become more complex because here I have just one stage. You can have multiple of them in here. But this is the tree of labels. We can call them topics that uh, our response is interested about. So we stop here at, at this level. And when we want to invalidate, like the Mm, the case I was doing before, I was invalidating a recipe. Here in these diagrams, I'm invalidating uh, an author. So if I move here, like let's say we want to update Alice's bio. Um, in this case, we target the author uh, topic, which means that every response that contains an author, doesn't matter if it's Alice or someone else, um, will be invalidated. Um, and this is a case, for example, of a query that I have here above is the spaghetti carbonara full. Um, so this contains the author and every recipe that is created with this template will have an author and all of them will be validated, which means all of your content for your recipe blog is invalidated uh, by just modifying a single author. Um, the new model, uh, of course, now includes uh, all of the content and we go down to the document level. So now when um, uh, an author, a single author is validated, we target that specific topic. So the, the topic about Alice Smith. But it's not as simple. Um, oh, this, this sounds relatively simple to me still, but it's probably really hard to find that topic then as a coder. Yes. Without using what, too much compute and looping and stuff. What is hard to, to detect so far, uh, I guess, in this mm -hmm. presentation is that a response might be interested or affected by something else that is not in the response content. Um, so we have we have some problems. Uh, some of them are on the this labeling side, labeling meaning attaching some topics to the response. And um, one of them is filtering and ordering. So whenever we have a query like this one, that is querying all the recipes that um, which name contain the word pizza, um, we will get a list. Let's say pizza one, pizza two, pizza, pizza three. Uh, but the response itself doesn't depend only on those documents. It depends also on, the, on the other documents that might depend, might might, so might become uh some document that has a title with pizza say pizza 4 is created only pizza 4 is updated but this response has to change so in this case we can't go document level for the um, recipe model 
we need to stay at model level because any pizza that is created might be one that changes this, this response. Another problem is space. We have a limited uh, number of tags that we can fit into the, um, it's a header, it's a limitation of our CDN. Only a given amount of bytes can end up in that header. And uh, uh, another problem is on the purging side because detecting the last ratio or past radius of change um, is not immediate. We might have changes uh, that uh, touch a document, but indirectly also affect other documents. And it's the case of, for example, a one-to-one -one relation. Let's say we have a recipe and the recipe of the day uh, models. Uh, and of course, when a new um, recipe is assigned as a recipe of the day, the old one is dropped. But we only say that new is the new recipe of the day. We didn't say anything about whole, but we need to detect that whole changes. So responses containing it needs to be invalidated. Um, this is on the, the purging side. This part is instead of the tagging side. For the tagging side, um, I will show you this one. So for what I said before, um, we might have cases where a given document is involved, but we can't go at model level, which means we might have responses that are targeted at model level and some that are targeted at document level. On the purge side, side we don't know. We just know that um, a document was updated or multiple documents were updated. So what we do to invalidate all the responses, either those that were targeted at model level and document level, uh, we tag, we push all the nodes that come in this tree that go from the, the root node to the node that we are actually modifying. So if some responses were not possible to be targeted at the document level, so let's say they stopped at author level, those will be invalidated. If instead we could go document level, we will invalidate that node too. If for some reason, uh, we didn't have enough space to either go model level in, in the header, then we will have stayed at publisher level because then we will have way less nodes to put in, in, this, uh, in these labels. Um, so we probably could have stayed at that level. So we will hit that node too. This way we are um, we ensure that however we tagged our response, given different scenarios, we will invalidate them correctly is uh, the complex part this is some mm -hmm. serious business the one thing i wanted to mention about this stuff is even if you don't use the studio right now and this this is just because it's such a composable architecture that we have this is on for everybody so even if you're in classic or if you're you know rendering your website now um, without having it statically generated but querying all the time all this new stuff that luca has been working on is is here for everyone um, so the hour is going fast. I think because I'm I'm very close with my peers here. We all I'm so excited about all the developer things we're talking about. Um, so I do want to end it with Alexi, who um, as someone in product has a slightly higher view of the things. And so I wanted to ask you, Alexei, why did we choose to actually do everything in parallel? and basically do like a big bang release versus just updating the old system in small bits what what's your opinion there or what were the you know the thoughts uh, patterns that we had i mean usually yeah you, usually when you like do the big update you you do really want to update in the bits and you would really want to do incremental updates like whenever possible basically but sometimes you just you just can't like we right now we did change our fundamental architecture and uh, we needed to like, rebuild the 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 platform itself and not just some pieces of ui and uh so yeah thanks to our like backend thanks to our graphql apis we were able to run those in parallel to yeah. at least uh so the whole point of beta is to be able to move from this big bang release to this incremental improvement because to 
to do something good, to, to, to release something good, you need to see feedback, you need to see how people use it. And that is why we are releasing beta now and not sometime in the future when it's on the feature parity. And uh, it also, even if you have the full product, uh, like if you release something better, one of the things you learn first as a product manager is if you think something is better, you know, it might not be better for everyone. So like the same we did for the content API, right? We have performance API now and we have our content API, uh, one with new caching, one with older caching, because we want to make sure that people who build their processes, build their workflows on something that works are not immediately affected and they can they have some time to update to the new to the new version and the same thing we do with studio we we introduce it for for people who can can work in the studio now they are welcome to work in the studio for those who are missing some features now they can still work in the old web app and then whenever we bring studio closer to the classic in terms of feature parity we can slowly migrate our customers and our users to the studio and uh, yeah that's basically the the best approach the best combination of approaches we have found and yes we did this big bank release but we also ma made it as early as possible to transition into this iterative Im improvement approach you make it sound like every software company should do it this way so you did your job <laughs> i love that no but it it, it feels like i'm not saying they no. shouldn't <laughs> no no exactly no it, it it is a good way um we just in the chat had basically the best final question for someone who's from italy so luca this one's for you hearing all the pizza talk makes me miss pineapple pizza so luca what's your opinion about pineapple pizza i was about to reply i have no oh opinion. wait i see the reply here i'm gonna put it Not there <laughs> there we go um so thank you for that answer luca because this is the the best italian answer you can give us i think um, I want to thank everybody for their contributions. Um, just in our Slack channel, our CTO, Daniel, actually um, put a little message about how awesome you guys all did. And I want to extend that. That's true. You, it was awesome. It's hard to talk about these things and not make it sound like marketing, but actually talk about the things and the challenges. And that's part of working at a startup and actually building cool stuff. That's why we're here. And so... All week, we had a bunch of sessions, right? And so they'll be all um, on YouTube. So they're all recorded. They will be streaming. And I can put that here if you want. Oh, we have to, we have a double. There we go. So feel free to actually subscribe to our YouTube channel and then watch all that other stuff. There's like, I think in total, we have four or five hours or more of like all this type of content. So that's super cool. Um, and let's see, what else do we have? Yes, we also have... Oh. This one. So um, yeah, Angie, who's backstage is adding the, the banners and I click one second after and I remove it again. That's part of how we work. Anyways, um, so you can join us on Slack and I know a bunch of the folks who are already in the chat now are on Slack already. Um, if you're not, join us. Ask the questions like you just asked here, we will answer them. All these folks, are everybody's in here um, with uh, developer relations in here, we are, um, first level support for any question you might have. And um, I think, Angie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're done for today. Yeah, I, I would just want good. to add one more thing. Is of in the community, we do have the channel for the studio feedback. Exactly. Feel free to ping me. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm active there and uh, all the other folks as well. So for anything studio related, we have a dedicated channel. Please join and please talk to us. All right. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And we will be back with a regular live stream next week. And for now, our Studio Launch stuff is done. Cheers. <laughs>